गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ ऑल इंडिया श्री शिवाजी मेमोरियल सोसायटीज कॉलेज ऑफ फार्मसी आय कल्याणी आजगावकर वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन द थर्ड डे ऑफ आर वेबिनार टेक्निकल सिरीज अ स्पेशल वेलकम टू आर एमिनंट गेस्ट डॉक्टर महेश भालगत चीफ ऑपरेटिंग ऑफिसर सिंजन इंटरनॅशनल वी वेलकम यू सर होल हार्टेडली फॉर दिस सेशन बिफोर वी स्टार्ट विथ द सेशन I would like to inform all the participants that a link a feedback link will be posted in the comment section towards the end of the session so stay tuned with that now to start off with the program i would like to invite mrs vidya babe to introduce our esteemed guest dr mahesh bhalgat over to you vidya thank you kalani madam welcome everyone I Vidya Babre welcome you to today's webinar entitled Testing Approaches hosted by ASSMS College of Pharmacy. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our distinguished speaker Dr. Mahesh Bhagat, Chief Operating Officer Syngen International Limited. Dr. Mahesh holds a PhD in medicinal chemistry from University of Utah, USA and a bachelor's degree in pharmacy from University of Mumbai. He has over 25 years of experience in both biotechnology and biologics. Dr. Mahesh has worked in all different phases of discovery, development, manufacturing and commercialization of biotechnology products. He has hands-on experience working with biotherapeutics including monoclonal antibodies, vaccines, diagnostic and agriculture biotechnology industries. His diverse experience comes from working in large and small companies such as Sanofi, Amgen, Celera Genomics and Molecular Probes. As a chief operating officer, Dr. Mahesh is responsible for all aspects of Syngen operations and is a member of is a member of the executive committee at Syngen. With this brief introduction, I welcome Dr. Mahesh Bhalgat sir. I now request Dr. Mahesh to proceed for the session. We are looking forward to your session, sir. Thank you. Thank you. It's indeed a pleasure for me to be here. I just want to make sure that the slides are visible and you can hear me well. So I'll start by um, you know setting the context around what we want to talk about today, uh, which is a specific aspect of what the entire world is faced with: the coronavirus pandemic, which is causing this disease, which is referred to as COVID-19. So we use, so we hear both of these words. COVID-19 is of course the disease that is caused by the virus the virus which was originally called as a novel coronavirus has now been called the SARS-CoV-2 and I'll come to that in a little bit with regards to the background and history around coronaviruses it's a relatively new disease it's a relatively newly discovered virus it's a relatively new virus that has been affecting humans and we know this because the first patient was diagnosed less than 6 months ago this was in december 19 in the city of uh, wuhan china because of the number of studies that are going on and the amount of work and the uh, huge impact that this virus has had while it's only been around for 6 months it seems like we've been uh, studying this virus for an eternity we've actually not collected so much data on almost any other virus as much as we have in such a short period of time with this particular coronavirus you know the irony of this is that despite all of this we still know very little about this there's a lot more that we need to know and understand which will help us lead to better treatments and vaccines the efforts for which are ongoing today there are about 8 vaccines that are in clinical trials and more than 400 candidates that are being pursued similarly there are hundreds and hundreds of um drugs that are being studied from a repurposing 
um, perspective to bring about treatments from an antiviral or other approaches. What is also important is that we need to know about this virus more so that we can control the spread in the meantime. And that's where testing comes in. And that's where I want to focus this talk for this afternoon on the need for testing. Let's, let's look at what are we up against. You know, um, what you see here is that the viruses are considered to be on the border of alive and non-live. Everything that you see below this are clearly non-live, including prions, uh, which have been studied and which are also responsible for diseases. And then here up above the line, you see what is alive and of course, higher and higher forms. Now, viruses fall on the cusp of this because we know viruses are not alive when they are outside the body, but they actually need a living cell to multiply. And that's why uh, we are, with this episode of coronavirus, we've learned a lot more about it. And we are today looking at it as simply the as was called out in 1977, that virus is simply a piece of bad news wrapped up in a protein. And, and, and we'll see why wrapped up in a protein when we look at this particular structure. Um, here is the, here's the structure or a very simplistic cartoon of the virus. Um, it's an oily membrane packed with genetic instructions, which are these particular instructions to make millions of copies of itself. And these instructions are in the form of an RNA. You know, the building blocks of RNA are the nucleotides A, C, G, U. And it is this viral material that gets infected and then leads to multiplication of the virus. So we are up against something really, really complicated, complex, rather small uh, in, in terms of its size and even in terms of, of its genome. Now, coronaviruses have, are, are not new. They have been known for a number of years. Uh, in fact, there is this asterisk uh, comic that some of you may be familiar with, and they have published in 2017 the name of the villain as coronavirus. In, in one of their um, comics, which is the Asterix and the, and the Chariot Race. So these have been known for known to us. What is also known is that coronaviruses typically impact animals. We have a certain... Sorry for the technical difficulties. I presume you are all still able to stay with me and I will just come back. I hope you're still able to hear me and you're able to see the slides again. So um, coronaviruses uh, infect a wide range of species and typically they infect animals. There are more coronaviruses that are known to infect animals and especially bats, some whales, some dolphins, uh, birds and some domestic animals as well. Of late, there have also been coronaviruses that have been well known to infect humans. Now, there, there are six of those that were known before this particular one, which is why this one is refer, was referred to originally as the novel coronavirus. So there are the less pathogenic ones, which are NL63, OC43, 229E, and HKU1. These are typically what cause your uh, common cold and flu. And then the, the more highly pathogenic ones are what you 
may have heard of that have come across in the last 10 to 15 years, the MERS and the SARS-CoV-1. So the, there is a whole history around the coronaviruses that have been present in different species, uh, including humans. And this is important, I'll come back to this later on, to understand why we need to have specific tests and why we need to have tests that are um, able to differentiate between what have been older infections of coronaviruses versus the most recent one. As I mentioned, we have been collecting a lot of information about this particular virus, and this is to understand more and more the approach that can be taken for tackling and handling and managing this virus. Now, the virus spreads through living cells. What it does is it injects this strand of RNA into the host cells, and that is what causes the infection. The entire genome, which is shown here, has many components to it. There is the ORF1AB protein, which is coded by some part of the genome. Some part of the genome codes for this spike protein, and the spike protein is something we'll come back to, very, very important. Then there are other proteins, E, M, N, and accessory proteins. What you see here on the right is actually the sequence that encodes for this particular spike protein. So far, it is known that it makes 29 proteins, and, all, and the function of all of these is not understood. However, the function of the spike protein and some of these other proteins as the nucleocapsid protein, these are understood, and, and we'll talk about those in just a little bit. As I mentioned, the knowledge of this SARS-CoV-2 genome really helps us tell what to test, what to target, testing-wise, as well as in terms of being able to design therapies, design vaccines. The genome encodes for specific genes. And uh, here you'll see that there are different proteins that are present. The E protein, which is referred to as the envelope protein, there is the M, which is the membrane protein. We talked about the spike protein. And then we also talked about the nucleocapsid uh, protein a little bit. All of these proteins are today being studied in a lot more detail to understand how much of these are conserved across different coronaviruses, how much of these are really involved in the replication, in the um, active uh, in the activity which involves binding of this spike protein to the human host cell protein through which it actually opens up the host cell protein and then injects this viral RNA into the host protein. The RBD is something that you don't see here because it, re it refers to the receptor binding domain. The receptor binding domain is a component of this spike protein. And it is that component of the spike protein that actually interacts with the human cell ACE2 receptor. When there is this interaction between the RBD, which is part of the spike protein, and the ACE2 receptor that is there on the human cells is when this opens up and you have the entry of the RNA material into the human host cell, which is then taking over the host cell machinery and replicating this um, RNA for multiplication and ultimately causing a lot more infection. So this is the background of how it is uh, working from a key components of the virus perspective. Now, having understood this, and uh, as I said, there is a lot more to understand, but let's now start diving into what does all of this mean? So at an individual level, when we want to tackle the disease, what do we want to understand? We want to understand if an individual is infected, and if an individual is infected, what kind of care should that individual receive? Should that individual receive just some oxygen? Should that individual be hospitalized? Should that individual be quarantined? All of those sorts of decisions need to be understood. Then there is an epidemiological level of understanding. That epidemiological level is so that you can manage the spread of the disease. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about the spread of the disease coming up on an upcoming slide on what are the components that really lead to spread of this disease from a 
theoretical and a testing perspective. Then there is the government and the policy level of understanding this pandemic. What restrictions to put in? When can you allow people to move? When should you deploy some resources? Which areas you should, prior, you should prioritize for testing? Which areas you should prioritize for movement of additional resources to? All of those bits are important to understand so that the government can make the right policy decisions around it. As you may have heard, there is a lot of work going on with regards to arranging temporary hospital beds, ventilators, so on and so forth. And why is that important? That is important because we want to do what is called as flattening the curve. And flattening the curve really refers to managing the level of infection to where the resources of the community or the government or the area or the municipality can really support. If you have too many people that get infected in one go, it will overwhelm the system and people will die or people will suffer from disease simply because we don't have the resources to manage them. Normally they would have survived, but because we don't have the resources to manage them, they will end up not getting the right treatment. And that is why it's very, very important to understand these bits and work towards what is called as flattening the curve. Now, there are a number of components to flattening the curve, and this is a very busy slide. I'll take you through it a, a little by little. There's a, there is something called the reproduction rate or the R0 or the R value. Now for COVID-19, it's estimated between two and three. It does change upon and it varies depending upon a number of factors. But what it refers to is how many people can one person infect once they have been infected? This is not the only factor. There's another factor called the K value or the dispersion factor that also plays into this. But let me go into a little more detail on the R0. If you look at this particular graph, what this shows is if you have an R value or an R0 value of 1.1, over a 60-day period, one person would infect a thousand people. Sorry, a thousand cases would, would, would increase under different infection rates, which means thousand people would become 25,000 if you were having a R value of 1.1. If the R value was brought down to one, that thousand would become only somewhere around 14,000 people and so on. So you can see how that goes down when the R value goes down. And this is in fact what UK was uh, aiming to do and what, what they were able to move forward with. They had a very high R value in the beginning part of March. By the, the later part of the month and towards April, they were able to bring it down through a number of measures, they stopped so, and treated uh, and brought in a lot more awareness around social distancing. They closed schools so that people don't come in contact with each other. They began lockdown measures and that is what helped them bring it down. To further understand this, if you think of this as if, an, uh, if you have an R0 of three, one person will infect three people and that will lead to an approximate doubling time of one week, which means every one week you will see the number of cases double. If you bring down the R0 from 3 to 1.5, this doubling rate will come down or, or, or will, will improve by fourfold. And, and again, the, the same thing as you go down. Now let's talk about the K factor. The K factor is another component that, dis, that determines how this disease spreads. You can have a K factor of one or you can have a K factor of below one. And the lower the number, the more the spread is in the form of a cluster, which means one person can really go and impact in a much bigger way. And it is not just a linear growth. Now, COVID-19, is estimated to be very, very low, and it may be even as low as 0.1. You see, I'm not saying anything from a very conclusive way, way perspective because some of these numbers are still being debated, uh, still being understood. And of course, they vary based on the conditions, based on the environment and the, uh, the, the, the measures that are being taken. However, we know that the COVID-19 numbers are very low because there are instances such as in Korea where it has been reported that one 
person alone has been responsible for the spread of disease to 800 people. This is where the spread happens in a clustered manner, and that's what is causing an impact to the amount of spread and the rate of spread that you see. The last one on this slide is the case fatality rate, which basically refers to what percentage of the population is uh, in, among the infected people is ending up with death. And for COVID-19, it's about 4%, which means about 96% of the people survive. But remember, this 96% of the people can survive if those of this population who need access to medical uh, systems can actually get it. Now, if a large number of that 96% do need access to medical systems at the same time, which they don't have because has been overwhelmed and our hospitals and our um, wards and all of the facilities that have been prepared are overwhelmed, they, that survival rate will come down. This then is, is another concept before I start getting into, uh, into the actual testing, um, which we know about incubation period is 14 days. This is one of the most complicated co components of this particular coronavirus. You have a very high asymptomatic phase, which means there is no symptoms that the patient has. They do shed virus at that time, which means there is virus that is is circulating in their body and is still available for infecting others. And But because they are not symptomatic, they are not isolated. Because they are not isolated, that shedding of the virus is impacting others. Now let's, uh, and then the this bit is about um, the emergence of antibodies, which I'll explain here. So you have this asymptomatic stage, which is typically is as, has a median value of the first five days when no symptoms arrive. Then there is the onset of symptoms, and then the body starts to build immunity. The first component of immunity building is IgM, which becomes detectable, and then the patient hopefully starts to recover. After around 14 days is when IgG starts to be produced, and the IgM starts to come down, and then, and then the patient recovery begins, after which the um, uh, virus is actually not detectable. And that's typically after 28 days. These are, again, typical numbers. These are not exact numbers. Now, that said, there are two broad approaches to how we need to approach testing. Why do we need to approach testing? As you, were, as you are now clear, it's very, very important to understand who are these people who are asymptomatic. And I'll go back here for a second who are in this phase of not even having symptoms or early onset of symptoms but need to be kept aside or kept in quarantine so that one, their recovery happens and second, they are not spreading the disease with the factors that I just mentioned about so that our own, uh, the systems and the um, availability of resources can be better managed. Now, there are two ways to look at the testing and there are many more than this. I only want to cover two different ones, which are the most common ones that you're hearing about. One is looking for the presence of the virus. And there you look for a fragment or a gene which is unique to the SARS-CoV-2, such as the spike protein RBD or the N protein. The other way to look for uh, testing is to look for indications that the body has started to uh, mount an immune response, and there you look for antibodies. And this is done through the serological tests. Let me uh, now introduce uh, uh, a little bit of a concept around how we look at the results from tests before we go into the actual tests. The concept around testing uh, begins with what is referred to as prevalence. Prevalence is a measure of the knowledge of the percentage of the population that is affected, which means what is the percentage of population around us that is actually affected. Now, if we say that disease prevalence is 50%, that means we believe through, through different measures that 50% of the population is affected and 50% of the population is not. So that's the, that's the prevalence. Sensitivity of a test is the probability by which a sample which is positive is actually referred, reported as a positive. So sensitivity basically refers to is, what is a true positive? 
So if there is a if there's a test that says the sensitivity of the test is 98, 99%, it means that it is able to detect 99% of the samples that are actually positive, it can detect them as, as, as really positive. Specificity, on the other hand, is the probability that a sample that is negative will actually be re reported as negative. So that's a true negative. I want to take a minute and sort of show you why these numbers are so important. And let's start talking about a situation where there is about 10,000 people that are tested. So if you have 10,000 that are tested and you have a prevalence rate, which we talked about as the amount of population that actually is infected, let's say the prevalence rate is 60%. What that means is you have about 6,000 that are actually positive and 4,000 that are actually negative. Now, if we go further into this and start to apply the, con the concept of the con sensitivity and specificity, as I mentioned, they refer to what is your false positive and your false negative. So now let us say that we have a false negative rate of only 10%. So a false negative rate of 10% will tell you that your true positives, which is your sensitivity, is telling you that 5,400 are truly reported as true positives. So you have 5,000 that are coming up as positive. On the other hand, you have 600, which is 10% that are coming up as false negatives because they are actually positive but they are getting reported out as false negatives. Now when you look at the false positive rate and let us say that we say that we have a false positive rate for a given assay of 5%, what that means is about 200 are false positive. And so these false positive are people who don't have the disease, but we have, uh, but they have been diagnosed and they have been communicated as they actually have the disease. And so therefore they end up in quarantine or they end up in, in under more restrictions and are not allowed to move and are not allowed to do their work and so on. The, of course, the even more complicated and the most scarier is the component about the 600 false negatives. Now, these false negatives are the ones where they are told as they are actually not having the disease when they have the disease and therefore they are going out, not being quarantined, not uh, maintaining uh, as much precautions and therefore infecting more. So this is why in general, it's very, very important to understand these concepts around these tests. I now dive into um, the, the two different types of tests that I mentioned, which is the RT-PCR and the uh, serological tests. The, uh, this is actually a, a, a huge sentence, but it's because it's uh, taken up from the WHO uh, and the CDC website, which is the Centers for Disease Control. It basically refers to how they have designed the use and approval of RT-PCR tests. They have gone for the nucleocapsid gene, which is um, the one that the test detects with two different primer probe sets, and I'll explain some of this to you in a little more detail. Along with that, they of course have controls, uh, which is the RNA's P gene. And the way this test works is you have RNA that gets isolated using RNA isolation kits that gets transcribed into the cDNA, which then gets amplified. And this amplified cDNA is used for probes that are put in where the probes and primers anneal to this particular amplified DNA. And then through TAC polymerase, the probes that have annealed start to degrade. Now the probes that have been annealed have a reporter dye on one side and a quencher dye on the other side. As the degradation happens, 
the reporter dye gets separated from the quencher dye, it leads to an increase in fluorescence and that's what you see. Here's a little bit more about it in general. These are referred to as nucleic acid amplification tests. Um, and um, as I mentioned, the ones that are reported out can be using uh, the NES um, or the receptor binding domain related genes. Um, there are of course different ways to uh, perform this. Uh, one can perform using multiple genes or just uh, two genes. And uh, the way this works is ultimately through a fluorescence readout. You have the you 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 have the heat that is used to split the strands. You have the primer annealing that happens. And in fact, I'll go to the next slide, which is a little difficult to read but easier to understand. So when you have the, the sequences that need to be uh, detected following the uh, amplification. You have a probe that is annealed and there is a reporter die on one end or the five prime end, a quencher die on the three prime end and the forward primer starts um, uh, extending to release the reporter die. Once the reporter die is released, this becomes fluorescent and the fluorescence is what is picked up. And after a certain uh, critical number of um, reporter molecules that are emitted, the fluorescence is detected. And that tells you that the sequence which these primers and probes were specific against does exist in that sample. And that is when you say that, okay, the sample is actually positive for the presence of the R gene or the S gene or the N gene. This is referred to as the TACMAN based uh, assay because it reuses both a reporter and a quencher. There is another way of doing the same PCR, which is through a cyber green dye. Uh, this is also an approved method uh, in uh, India where there are kits that are using cyber green uh, fluorescence. It works in a slightly different manner, but all still uses uh, primers, it does not use probes because the cyber green actually uh, fluoresces when it is bound to double standard DNA. So when you when you start to pick up double standard DNA that is present, uh, you see the cyber green uh, fluorescence, and this is a net increase in fluorescence, which is again detected by uh, one of the instruments that is used for this testing. We in Syngene have uh, designed an RT-PCR lab to support the testing efforts that are required in the country right now, because along with the need for kits, along with the need for reagents, there's also a need to increase the testing capacity. And therefore, we've actually designed a lab uh, that can do this. And I want to show you a, short, a small video on the care and precautions and the way that the lab has been set up to give you an idea of how RT-PCR testing is done in real life. RT-PCR assay is the most accurate assay currently available in the industry for the detection of COVID-19. This reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction test specifically is able to detect certain conserved regions within the SARS-CoV-2 virus from nasopharyngeal samples. The, this uh, the assay is based on primers, is, is run by primers and probes. Um, these are sets that are specific to certain different uh, SARS-CoV-2 genomic regions and all these assays are run uh, including controls, positive and negative controls and are monitored very stringently for their performance. COVID-19 RT-PCR at Syngene starts with sample receipt in a contained manner with adequate biosafety practices and precautions. A three-tier packaging of the samples is made to ensure safe custody of samples during transportation. Sample transfers across laboratories is done through a sealed one-way openable pass box. Biosafety is practiced as per uh, SARS COVID-19 RTPs to ensure safe custody of samples during transportation. 
sample transfers across laboratories is done through a sealed one-way openable pass box. Biosafety is practiced as per Well, folks, it looks like uh, the video is uh, partly working, but partly not. So I'll, I'll move on, but it gives you an idea of the environment uh, that needs to be managed. Because at this point of time, uh, you realize that this is still a virus that we don't know how to tackle. People working with this virus are not immunized and therefore need to take the utmost precaution, utmost care. And there's multiple steps that go through in RT-PCR tests. Now, a, a little bit more about the RT-PCR test, uh, you know, the, it does detect the virus presence at an individual level. And it is, of course, a readout at the time of testing, which means that when the test sample was collected, if there was sufficient virus to be uh, picked up is only then when the test will be positive. It does not tell you anything about previous disease exposure. Um, you may have heard that there is a lot more talk about whether there will be another wave, whether there is... Uh, protection that is there, none of that is actually told by the RT-PCR assay. And it does not also tell you whether there are asymptomatic people that exist in the community without actually having gone through and tested all of the asymptomatic people. And then, of course, we talked about the fact that whatever is the percentage of, uh, of a given assay, there will be some level of um, false negatives, false positives that could be associated with them. And this is where I wanted to show you one of the uh, studies that was done where uh, a particular lab has looked at their own in-house genes, of course, to be picked up during the assay validation using a certain number of positive samples, but have also compared, and these are all these are many different assays that are available out there from different manufacturers against different target genes, and what is the specificity that they have seen and what is the alignment that they have seen with regards to the positives in the validation, which shows you the percentage of agreement that they have with whatever has been claimed by the kit manufacturer. And you see that it's not always perfect. And, and this is where um, it comes to understanding and interpretation of the results as a very, very important component in the use of RT-PCR or any other diagnostic assay for that matter. Now, this is also where the serology tests come in, because as we saw, the RT-PCR assays give you a certain amount of information, especially about active infection. Serology tests, on the other hand, measure something completely different, which is they measure the body's response to the infection. There are different ways of performing serological assays, and I'll, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But... The, there are serological assays that are used for diagnosis purposes, such as the ELISAs and the lateral flow assays. And then there are the virus neutralization assays, which are performed in what are referred to as biosafety level three facilities, very high containment facilities, um, because they involve the use of live virus to look for whether or not this live virus can be neutralized by um, antibodies that are coming from any of the test samples. So um, given that the nature of the serological assays are of where they look for antibodies, they can look for antibodies against the spike protein, RBD, the viral nucleoprotein, or any other component of the virus that is immunogenic. And in a way, therefore, they become complementary to the RT-PCR. What does that mean? Here, as, uh, we are not detecting the virus, we are actually detecting the antibody. The presence of the antibody you want to look for in a sample that is going to be the best for it, which is typically serum or blood samples in case of this particular virus, but it is also uh, likely to be present in oral fluids. 
it tells you about history of previous infection versus active infection because active infection comes from the virus antibodies don't uh, don't necessarily tell you about uh, active infection and it's only valid after the body has actually had time to generate antibodies which means you may have been exposed or somebody may have been exposed to the virus however has not yet had the time to generate antibodies remember the curve that i've shown you before where the antibodies take some time to be developed especially with the igm forming first and the iggs coming later it tells you of course as a very important tool from an epidemiological perspective what percentage of the population is protected what percentage of the population has now what we may refer to as an immunity passport and therefore can actually go around with uh, some level of understanding that they have actually been exposed already now that does not mean that uh, when somebody has been exposed they will not get a disease again that is still up for debate and discussion i won't get into that right now um, but uh, it if it is known that you don't you have long lasting immunity if that comes from your first infection then of course it could lead to this concept of immunity passports that people may have which will make them easier and easier to go about and interact and to get back to life as we knew it before uh, coronavirus as with any other assay there are things to watch out when you interpret the results um you in this case specifically you do need to worry about antibodies against other coronaviruses as i mentioned uh, there are other coronaviruses that have been known and uh, impacting humans and so that we would have as human beings exposed to some of those and therefore have antibodies developed against those and you need to design assays that pick up antibodies against sars cov2 and not antibodies against any of those other viruses it's also of course important uh, from a timing of sampling perspective and then the same concepts of both sensitivity and specificity that we talked about are important so a little bit about uh, you know what are the proteins that are uh, important to look for antibodies from uh, and and the, how to take that into consideration from a uh, assay design perspective the spike protein is that protein which gives it the mushroom kind of shape um and it is what is there on the surface you'll recall that the spike protein is what has this receptor binding domain component of it which is what is interacting with the human receptor ace2 angiotensin converting enzyme receptor and leading to the infection and so it's really really useful to know whether antibodies that are present are going to be binding to this receptor binding domain because then you know those antibodies are not just good for detecting but those antibodies could potentially stop the virus from actually getting uh, uh, multiplying by not having the receptor binding domain or the rbd bind to the ace2 the spike protein coming back to that has two subunits s1 and s2 um, which is what facilitate the attachment to the um, um, uh, fusion of uh, of the host cells and then there is a nucleocapsid protein uh, which is the protein basically the rna binding protein that plays a structural and non structural role in the infection and forms the part of the viral capsid and this uh, and there is data that suggests that this also has additional roles to play in the pathogenesis of this particular virus now serology tests um, again to to detect these antibodies can be detected to have to de uh, can be designed to detect uh, different types of antibodies i'm going to talk about the igm and the igg because those are the most prevalent kind of tests that are available today um igm as uh, you know is one of the first antibodies that is produced in the during the infection large in size because it is more it is more of a pentamer but it's also only uh, about 10% of the total antibody count so from a sensitivity perspective it's not the best thing to go and try to have uh, an assay for you could have uh, some challenges in the fact that you don't have as much of this as you might have of the other antibody which is the igg now this other antibody which is the igg is what is produced it is much smaller but that is what comes from the mature b cells and leads to a longer lasting immunity 
and which is which is where you might be able to find this months or even years later and and uh, exposure to the particular antigen in this case the SARS-CoV-2 virus this uh, is is your first response but it also dies away rather soon and therefore depending on when the test is performed you may be able to pick up IgM but you may not be able to pick up IgM as well and there uh, and so all of these have different components that need to go into designing the assay now on a specific approach from an ELISA assay perspective many of you are probably already familiar with this there are different ways of doing the ELISA assay you can have um, the antigen what is called as the antigen down ELISA you put the antigen down which in this case would be let's say your nucleocapsid protein or your RPD or your spike protein the these are the antibodies that may be present in the patient serum that are being detected which you then ultimately detect through a secondary antibody which uh, which has a uh, signal component to it such as an hrp which when uh, when the substrate when it sees its substrate will give you a color there's the other type which is the double antigen bridging assay uh, where you look for binding the antigen but you also come in with the antigen that is tagged to a um, uh, HRP or an alkaline phosphatase enzyme um, and then again leads to signal generation but telling you that both of these are present and therefore this antibody is actually present in the sample. Then there's the antibody capture ELISA where you put uh, where you try to capture the antibody of the patient itself uh, and then in, it in turn looks for um, the um, um, something that may be of interest here, which is the IgM. And, and so here, in case of COVID-19, if you were to design this assay, you would come in with an anti-IgM antibody, pick up the, the IgM from the patient sample, uh, and then look for a way to get the signal through the antigen, such as the spike protein or the nucleocapsid protein and then ultimately look for a way to generate the signal through enzymatic reaction. So these are the different ELISA formats. Um, similarly, there is the lateral flow assays. The lateral flow assays are also serological in nature because they are also detecting antibody. The way they detect antibody is uh, through the formation of these strips. Um, they, they are what are called as point of care devices um, because they are much easier to use. They don't need a lab setup. Uh, we saw that the RT-PCR needs a lab setup. We also know that the ELISA uh, has multiple steps. When you add each of these and do washing, measure the signal with an instrument, and so therefore requires the setup of a lab um, and is then only performed under those laboratory or clinical settings. The lateral flow is a point of care device as I am coming back to it. Um, where you add the patient sample, such as blood or serum, you add a little bit of a diluent, and, the, and that diluent, then you let it react for 15 to 20 minutes when it moves from the place of uh, dropping to where the test strips are. So if you did put in the sample over here, the, uh, the sample actually moves by capillary action. And depending on what all is present in the sample, it gives you these three different bands or one band or two bands. Now, if you didn't see the IgM and the IgG band, then it's negative. Uh, it's positive for IgM and IgG, depending on when the sample was taken. And if you see both of these, uh, it, you could also have a situation where the patient is uh, advanced enough in its disease state that IgM is already gone, but IgG is there and therefore you find IgG to be present or is not advanced enough and only IgM is present and IgG has not been formed yet. Now, if in any time you don't see the C or the control band, then you don't read that assay itself and it's considered invalid. So that's a, the, the, that's a brief of uh, how the assays work, what are some of the key components around understanding those assays. And now I'll move to doing a little bit more comparison and, over, uh, and trying to wrap it up from what this means in a day-to-day -day, uh, situation either from a use perspective or interpretation perspective. A little bit of comparison here to start with, um, both nucleic acid assays and the ELISA assays do require a facility, although I've called this out only for the RT-PCR to compare it with the lateral flow or the rapid assay. They go on for hours, typically 
by the time you get results back, um, it, it's several hours or, or maybe even a day. It does need to be done in a, in a laboratory, whereas lateral flow does not. Uh, does need technicians here you don't need technicians uh, somebody can just drop a um, uh, drop of blood and measure it just like today a lot of glucose uh, meters are available which uh, work in the same manner um, extensive operation complicated um, things to do um, can have challenges with false negatives similarly can have challenges with rapid flow as well i think both are for for that interpretation of results understanding of the assay is very very important this of course also requires cold chain for moving the sample from where it is collected to where it is actually tested and then this can happen more on more on room temperature however this has definite clinical value because it is the gold standard for deductive testing and conclusion of the fact where that somebody does have active disease or not and this because again it's measuring antibodies it is more about whether or not somebody had the infection or what stage of infection they are in, but not an active disease. To help illustrate that point, uh, and this is one specific uh, article that was published um, um, about a month and a half ago. And so these numbers again could change, but it is more illustrative that depending on the day of um, when after symptoms, the sampling has been done, you may find RT-PCR to be varying in its positive nature. You may also find that IgM and IgG would be varying in their positive nature. Um, IgM and IgG uh, or total antibody would be more and more positive towards the 15-day uh, or the 14-day time frame. The RT-PCR will be more and more positive in the earlier stages when the virus is still in the system. I mentioned earlier that it does matter that there are other coronaviruses that we have been exposed to. And there, this is another component that really helps understand how an assay should be built and what are the design components that should go in. If we look at homology, this is amino acid homology for the N protein versus the S protein, and you compare that between the SARS-CoV-2, which is the current infection that we are facing for COVID-19, versus the last SARS that, that was there, the nucleocapsid protein has an amino acid homology of approximately 90% versus the S protein homology of 77%. Doing the same comparison between the SARS-CoV-2, sorry, the should read SARS-CoV-2 versus MERS is about 49% uh, for the nucleocapsid protein and S protein is 33%. What this tells you is that uh, you have a better chance of picking up specific antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 in comparison to each of these if you use um, the S protein versus the N protein um, given that some of the um, amino acid sequences are going to be much more common between SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1 or MERS. So based on all of this kind of confusing, a uh, lot of information, you know, how should serology testing be used? And when, when is it applicable? When, when should one actually get into testing? So it, it's best to use uh, serology testing for epidemiological and understanding of seroprevalence. It's also the right one to use for patient convalescent plasma donors determination. You may have heard that there is a therapeutic approach being tried, which is where uh, patients who have recovered, um, because we saw that um, death rate is 4%. There are a lot of patients who have actually recovered and their plasma is being used in cases of very, very severe um, patients uh, because these plasma, these donors would have IgG in their uh, plasma, which, which can help in the treatment of other severe patients. And so serological tests can be used to determine the presence of good plasma donors. And then, of course, uh, these are also useful in understanding more about the RT-PCR negative patients, um, given that there is a potential that that the, the um, late stage RT-PCR negative patients would actually demonstrate positive to the serology tests. And therefore, this is uh, not a diagnostic test. It is uh, it it cannot be used to understand active current disease, um, but it is much more about understanding protective immunity. And uh, it, therefore, a caution to say that because we don't know the, la the lasting nature of that protective immunity, uh, whether or not somebody can get reinfected, it also does not limit 
the need for social distancing practices, use of protective equipment and all of that, that somebody may have, even if they were shown to be serologically positive and therefore pre-exposed to COVID-19. One last bit of information I want to share with you is there is constant approaches going on in improving the testing. Why? Because as you can tell, it's really important to know who has had the disease, who is having the disease, who is asymptomatic, so that we can manage it better and not have too many people catch the disease. One of the approaches that many um, um, organizations um, have looked for is to say, let's increase the number of PCR machines, let's increase the number of lateral flow devices that, are, that can be brought in and, and increase the throughput that way. There's another approach which involves what is called as deep sequencing using molecular barcoding, where you can pool samples from many different patients and then subject them to a, uh, a um, simultaneous sequencing and try to uh, subject as many as five to 25,000 samples in one test. The test of course runs for a very long period of time, but it tells you in an entire population what the spread of the disease is. Now this is not yet uh, something that I have seen as approved, but I know that this is something that has been worked on, including uh, efforts these are, that are going on um, in Sinjin to make such a, such a test a reality. I'll close then with um, giving a little bit more insight on all of the work that Sinjin is doing. The last bit that I just talked about, we are, do, we are working in collaboration with public institutions to understand population genetics around this. There's a lot of things going on with regards to looking for mutation. Viruses, by definition, um, are prone to mutations and therefore understanding those mutations to make sure all of our tests, the probes, primers, are against the sequences that are still valid. And so that's the, that's work that we are doing. We are also working on in areas of vaccine development where we are supporting preclinical development, clinical development, and novel technologies for bringing vaccines onto the market. Um, we are also working in the area of drug repurposing and other therapeutic approaches to make sure that the efforts that are there from looking at pre-existing drugs, and you all may have heard of remdesivir, you may have heard of fabripavir, you may have heard of hydroxychloroquine, which was something that was talked about a, a, a few weeks back, uh, as potential drugs that may be useful. And those, of course, need studies to be completed to arrive at the therapeutic approaches. So we are working on those, plus, of course, antibody discovery. And that antibody discovery, uh, one of the components to that is looking for neutralizing antibodies from convalescent sera. We, of course, talk about the fact that we are actively doing RT-PCR testing. We actually set up a whole laboratory for that. We are developing serological assays, and we are also providing critical reagents that make these assays possible, uh, such as the probes, primers, and the proteins, and, and, and many other things that we are doing in this effort. So with that, I'll come to an end um, by reminding all of you that uh, today, um, the need is for testing more and more. The more we test, the more we understand the um, uh, disease spread, the disease prevalence around us, and who needs to be isolated, who needs to be, uh, who needs uh, to have resources available, which areas the resources should go into, what should be open, what should be locked down, so on and so forth. Uh, today, uh, India still is, uh, and just uh, yesterday I have seen news that India has reached uh, um, a target of one lakh tests completed per day, which is great, and we need to up that number even more and more. You know, you all are uh, pharmacy students uh, attending this particular lecture. I wanted to bring up this quote, and I'll read it, and then uh, um, some parts of it, uh, and then let you read it. It is the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. Uh, it talks about belief, uh, incredulity, season of light, darkness, all contrasting things that come from Charles Dickens uh, in, the, in the famous tale of two cities. I want to reflect on that for you all, um, specifically to call out the fact that we could say that we are in the worst of times. Obviously, we are all very, very worried, very, very concerned about the way this spread is going on, the fact that there is a lot of effort to understand the disease, but also then to make sure 
that we have the treatment uh, capabilities, the vaccines, all of those things that are coming in, only then can we actually breathe a sigh of relief. So we are all in a panic mode today. We are all concerned. We are all uh, seeing this as a very challenging time. On the flip side, it's also the best of times, especially for the pharmacy community. This is the time to really work together and make a difference, bring science to the forefront of solving problems whether it is through improved assays, improved tests, or whether it is through the you know, novel approaches to vaccine production, vaccine discovery efforts, um, uh, therapeutic discovery efforts, looking for ways to um, uh, increase oxygen supply, because we know that this is something where uh, that, uh, that apart from other uh, organs is really targeted towards the lungs, and measure many, many opportunities for this particular group to use its scientific knowledge and make a difference. And I think um, I want to leave you with that thought of starting to think about one, let's spread the awareness around the importance of testing. Let's spread the awareness around the importance of physical distancing. Um, of course, hand washing and the use of uh, masks that are clearly going to be targets for us to make sure that we continue our efforts on flattening the curve. Last but not least, I do want to thank um, several folks um, who have been able to help me in making this presentation for all of you today. And there I want to thank my specific team, um, which is the team of uh, Harry, Jose, uh, and his communications team uh, who have helped me put this together. There is also the references that I have used in this. And so thanks for all of those folks who have been able to make this possible. Um, uh, on the AISS MS team, the All India Sri Shivaji Memorial Society, several of the office bearers, I know uh, not everyone is able to join us, but certainly uh, Maloji Raja Chhatrapati. Uh, I had a word uh, earlier with your principal, Dr. Ashwini Madkulkar. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am. Uh, the media team who has worked on making sure that this moves as flawlessly as it has done with a couple of uh, minor snacks, I would say. Uh, and then the coordinators of this technical lecture series, which I think is really incredible that you guys are taking this opportunity to bring uh, experts, to bring scientific knowledge uh, to a community that can actually make a difference, uh, which, is the, which is the pharmacy community. I know that... Uh, um, there are some others that I may have missed. Uh, I believe Babita and Akshay are also worth thanking here from the AISS MS team. Thank you very much. And I'll open it up for questions. You're on mute, ma'am. I am not able to hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, sir. It was a, a highly information packed, latest information packed session. And all the details of the assay were really very, very interesting. And you made it really interesting with the video. So thank you once again for that. And uh, now we move on uh, to the question answer round uh, for which I've invited uh, Shivani Rao, madam. Good evening, sir. Thank you, Kalyani, madam. Uh, sir, it was a very, very informative session. I hope I'm audible, sir. Hello. Yes, you are. Yeah. Yes, you are. It was a Please very, very informative uh, session. And uh, we ha you have imparted us with profound knowledge. Thank you very much for the same. Uh, we have some delegates who will uh, who would like to interact with you and ask some questions, followed by some questions which were asked by the delegates on the chat, which I'll be asking on behalf of them. So I request uh, uh, Babita Agarwal, madam, from MMCOP, uh, College of Pharmacy, to join in. Yes, madam, please present your question. Uh, good evening, sir. Sir, am I audible? If you speak up a little bit, that will be better. Okay, so uh, am I audible? Yes. Now? Yes, sir. Yeah. So thank you for such an informative session on serology testing. Actually, so many webinars we have attended. 
but this is the first one where we came to know about the details about the testing procedures. So I have few questions. The very first question is, you talked about false negative uh, things which you would get when you're testing. So uh, could it be that they could be positive, but we are getting it negative? Or are they run again and again so that they are confirmed to be negative? So yeah, um, you know, as I as I mentioned, there are certain reasons by which something may be uh, picked up as negative, um, and which is why, um, if we had the infinite resources, um, then there are certain uh, situations and certain conditions where it is recommended that you run the assay more than once. Now, typically, you don't always run those more than once because of the limitation of resources, um, but the confirmation will come through that additional testing because it is it is possible that yes you could have both false positives and false negatives thank you, thank you so much sir for the answer thank you you're on mute shivani sorry sorry yeah, now I request Dr. Sonali Mahaparle, Madam, to uh, D.Y. Patil College of Pharmacy. Please join. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Audible? Hello? Yes, yes, you are audible. audible. Yes, ma'am. Please. Yes, yes. Ma Sir, your uh, session is very informative and uh, excellent session. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, I want to ask question that uh, are there differences in between that N protein and uh, uh, N protein and protein? Hello? I don't know if it's my audio is good, but I am not hearing you. Are there differences in between N protein and E protein? Mm -hmm. So she is asking, uh, are there Yes, there are. The, there are yeah, yeah. So, 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 so there are differences between the N protein and the E protein. In fact, um, one of the reasons that you don't see too many uh, um, assays or you don't see work that is done against the E protein is because uh, the E protein is not as likely or is not as easy to be picked up uh, from an uh, assay perspective. On the other hand, of course, the N and the S protein are the ones that are much more likely to be picked up. Most that you see on serology wise are actually toward either either of the Yes, so Nari Madam, I hope okay. you put your answer. Okay. Huh. Thank, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. So thank now we ma have yeah, thank you. Now we have a student, uh Mr. Ayush Thole asking you a question. Yes, Ayush, go on. Hello, sir. Am I, am I audible? Yes, you are, Ayush. Yes, Ayush. Yes, sir, okay, sir. So the question is, uh, those who are getting cured from this disease without getting any vaccine, so is there any other chance that they will get infected again? Or it is like that, uh, like a chicken pox, like when they get cured, so they won't get uh, infected for at least four to five years. So I wish I could, uh, you know, that's a, the, the, that's a very, very good question. I wish I could uh, actually uh, tell you the answer to that. I don't think we know the answer to that at this point of time. Uh, it is expected that, the, that there is immunity that will be developed. But one of the things that does happen is when somebody is infected, they develop antibodies. And those antibodies, if they are neutralizing antibodies, maybe you can go on mute, so that way the background behind you is not impacted. But if they are neutralizing antibodies, only then are they actually protected. And today, we don't really know enough to say what is that protection duration like? What is the nature of the long, you know, long lasting protection that comes to a patient who is already exposed? I don't really have a good answer for you, apart from the fact to say that typically you should, but, but we don't know that. Yes, Ayush, I hope the question has okay, been sir. answered. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ayush. Yes, Thank sir. you. Okay. Yes, so we have some questions. We have one question from Deshpande, sir. He is asking, um, 
what supplies are being distributed by international reagent resources for these COVID-19 testings? So I would say that, uh, you know, the when we talk about COVID-19 testing, uh, there are a number of things that are required to do the RT-PCR assay. Um, there is an RNA extraction kit uh, that is required. There is the RT-PCR kit itself. There is a probe and primers that are a key component of that. And then there is the viral transfer medium. So this may be a few of things that are required. More and more, there are Indian companies that are actually developing all of the components in India. Um, you know, one of the examples of that that I would offer is the probes and primers. The probes and primers were typically not made by too many sources within India, which is where we in Sinjin have come up and said that we use our automotive facility to manufacture those. So more, uh, most of the re components of these indigenous kits are now starting to be made in India. The lateral flow devices or the serological assays are also going in that direction. Today, many of those lateral flow assays are coming from outside India, but there are efforts to make those in India as well. So ELISA assays, of course, are, are being made in India, and uh, we are also developing our own ELISA assay that we will also be able to bring to the market very, very soon. Wow, that's really commendable. Great. Yeah, importing many components, but slowly, slowly, we are making all of those in India. And, and and we have an initiative um, which is uh, which is sorry for the technical glitches we'll have sir immediately joining in I yes. think I, I think I, but but I was referring to our. Uh, we've actually formed a national body called NBRIC, which actually brings um, indigenous manufacturers together to make sure that we can share um, knowledge around what is needed and what is available and how to increase Indian capacity for this. Wow, that's that's really great, sir. Okay, so we have one more question from Shweta Saikar. How could one prevent the spread of uh, COVID-19 during the uh, non-symptomatic stage. What could be uh, done for this thing? So I think you have to treat everybody as COVID. The, the best way to do that is to treat everybody that you come in contact with as having COVID-19 and as being asymptomatic. Therefore, maintain your distance because you know that the virus uh, is, is not going to travel more than a certain number of feet, let us say six feet. And then Make sure that you are that you are hand washing. You're not touching your your eyes, nose, uh, and your face. Not touching surfaces, um, and then of course using the face mask. I think that's the that's the best that you have to do. But for that, the approach that you have to take is that anybody you come in contact with, you have to assume that they are COVID nineteen positive. And there's nothing wrong and there's nothing bad about being COVID nineteen positive. The way the disease is going. A, a very, very, very large percentage of the entire world's population will at some point of time become COVID-19 positive. That is what is spreading. And it is what, what we are trying to do right now is, is just minimize the spread. And for that spread, treating somebody as COVID-19 positive does not mean you treat them badly. You just say that, well, you know, the, I may be COVID-19 positive, you may be COVID-19 positive, let's just stay away from each other. Yeah, right, sir. Right, sir. Okay. Sir, uh, do these testing labs require BSL-3 uh, for testing, uh, like RT-PCR uh, testing and the uh, serological testing? So the serological testing, uh, because the virus type, uh, is, especially if you think about it, the IgG uh, tests are typically going to be after 14 days of infection. So the virus titers are of one very low. Uh, second, they are designed uh, to be uh, from the blood where, again, the antibody levels are high, but the virus levels are low. So therefore, the virus load is low. So they don't they, they don't need any of these containment facilities. On the other hand, the RT-PCR does, uh, it, and it depends on what sort, of a what sort of a treatment that the virus has gone through after the virus sample has been collected. Once the virus has been collected through a swab, it does go through an inactivation process uh, in the in, in 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 some cases depending upon the composition of the viral transport medium 
uh, we can bring down the infectivity. However, um, the, still from a, from a precaution and care perspective, it is good uh, and, and required to make sure that it is being conducted in a biosafety cabinet. It is, we, in fact, do our testing in a BSL-2 facility, but not a BSL-2. So we have one last question. Uh, is plasma therapy a boon or a bane? <laughs> Um, I, I think today, um, you know, we have we have clearly seen that um, plasma therapy is something that the governments and the, and the health authorities uh, have had to take a decision on and say that, look, let's start using it because in the absence of any other tools, we do we do need to do that. Now, as long as we are able to find and uh, the right plasma which is sufficient in the titer concentration uh, from an antibody presence perspective and is not going to have any contraindication uh, from uh, impacting any of the other systems and having a side reaction. It is something that will continue to be used. So I would say it is, it is definitely a boom. Um, and in fact, this is what will actually lead us to finding an antibody the, that, that will become a therapeutic antibody somewhere. Right. Right. Thank you, sir. There are quite a number of questions still coming in. And uh, due to lack of time, I think we can share these questions uh, through your mail and uh, we can get the answers for the same, sir. Thank you very much for a very informative session and in, uh, enlightening us with very uh, nice information and knowledge. Thank you, sir. Now I uh, request Komal, madam, to please join in for the session. Thank you, uh, Shivani ma'am. Now it's time to thank all those who have helped in making this webinar a very resounding success. So on behalf of AICSMS College of Pharmacy, I, Komal, would like to thank our distinguished speaker, Dr. Mahesh Bhalgat, Chief Operating Officer at Sinjin International, for making this webinar more interesting by sharing his experience on topic of testing approaches. I would like mm -hmm. to express a profound thanks to Shri, Shivaji, uh, to Shri Maloji Rajiv Hosre, uh, Honorary Secretary and other office bearers of All India Shri Shivaji Memorial Society. I would also like to thank our principal ma'am, Dr. Ashwini Madhulkar, for her encouragement and constant support. I would also like to thank the media team at All India Shri Shivaji Memorial Society, as well as uh, Shivani ma'am, Kalyani ma'am, and uh, uh, Shikal ma'am, who are the members of our college media team. I am also very much thankful to all the coordinators of this technical lecture series and the coordinator of today's webinar, Professor Dr. Mrinalin Damle, ma'am, as well as Ms. Priyanka Kandare. I specifically thank all the delegates who have participated in large numbers and made this event a great success. Last reminder to all the delegates that our next webinar is scheduled on 24th May at 11 AM. And the topic is intellectual property rights and generic pharmaceutical industry. And the speaker for this webinar is Dr. Anshuman Ambike, General Manager, Global IP, MQR Pharmaceuticals Pune. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, all the participants. We are ending the session today. Thank you.